make sure we are actually streaming and not just recording. Yes, we are. Okay. So we're going out on two channels. So why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. Eric? My name is Eric Stromberg. I am uh, work for Los Alamos National Laboratory. I uh, worked for Dow Chemical for 24 years. Before that, I was a journeyman electrician, uh, licensed state fire alarm technician. So I've been in the electrical industry for quite a while. Yes, you have. And so today's session on IAI News Live, we wanted to focus on 240 volts and below. Right. Okay. Three phase, single phase, single phase. Below. I'm going to say single phase. Single phase. Okay. Yeah. Let's focus on single phase. We're going to talk about the electrical hazards and hold on. Uh, hold on. Let me go to this. And I, um, Hey, we got David Engelhart, Engelhart online. Hey, David. David's out of Florida. And, uh, let me just do this. I have to do, I have to do this. I think this is it. All right. So today's topic is hazards, 240 volts and below, single phase, and it all starts now. All right, so we're back. I had to do that. Okay. That's, that's the stinger. We're back. We're back. Okay, so, and we got Michael Hofkin. So, Michael and Fred and David, I'm out here at the Electrical Safety Workshop. We're in Reno, Nevada at the Peppermill Hotel and Resort, I think it is. Hotel and Resort. Because there's a big pool out there. I was going to go outside and do it by the pool, but it started raining. It's outdoors. You wouldn't be nice if it had a cover, right? Oh, yeah, and it started raining, so I couldn't do it. So, we secured, <laughs> we basically uh, took over the business center. Oh, yeah. And, uh, uh, and and um, and we thought, well, the, the conversation of today is 240 volts and below. Single phase. Single phase, the electrical hazards. Okay. Okay. Um, you have a lot of experience in, in, in electrical at the at the Los Alamos. So what do you do at, I mean, what was your previous role? I'm, I'm not sure what your current role is. I know you keep getting promoted up. And uh, yeah, stuff, I so. don't really know what my role is. <laughs> you know, my role is whatever comes up. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I'm in charge of the electrical engineering standards there. Um, I work with, so I'm, I'm, we have a lot of young engineers and okay. I really enjoy because I, I work with the breaker crews at night. Okay. I have the opportunity to, to do the, the maintenance of breakers. Really awesome. We have, the facility is 40 square miles, wow. about 1500 buildings, about the size of Washington, DC. Oh my God. And, and so, but we have a continual breaker maintenance program going on. And so I get to take the young engineers out there and uh, we get to see electrical systems with panels off. You wow. know, with the covers off. Right, right. And, and you, we look at the bus work, we look at this, that, the other thing. We say, you know, hey, this has got two body jumpers here. We need to remove one of them for objectionable current. <clears throat> and so uh, I said, well, this is the way we did things in the 50s. This is the way we did things in the 60s. Right, the 70s. right, right. And they tell me, well, but wait a minute, this doesn't look right. Now, well, hold on a second. It was right before 2008. <laughs> They allow that. Yeah. So it's also a code history lesson. Ah, uh, in a facility that large that's been around that long, that's I'm sure right. there's a lot of opportunities there, for improvements. Oh, well, okay, or just leave it the way it is, okay? Yeah. Because there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. I personally don't like the word grandfather. It's not grandfathered in. It was fine when it was built. It'll be fine for eternity. Yeah, yeah. We don't do it that way today. As long as you understand the hazards. Yes. Right. And and I think that's that's exactly right. Absolutely. So so and and we're focusing in on 240 volts and below in this discussion. Which if you think about if you think about where, so let's just talk about like where would you see 240 volts? I'm sure you've got 24, you've got single phase 120 volt circuits all through your. Facility. You know, I try to have it as little as possible. Because, really? Well, because single phase just makes my brain hurt. <laughs> I don't, it's it's. I don't know what to do with single phase. Yeah. You know. So, but yes, we do have single phase, and and I love to talk about transformers uh, because what I find is that. <clears throat> People look at transformers as, as a black box, yeah. and they and they see the input, they see the output. 
But what I like to do is, okay, let's look at what's happening inside the transformer. Let's yeah. look at the iron core. Let's look sure. at the windings. Let's let's look and see how the flux goes through the windings and creates right. volts per turn. Yeah. Uh, getting off track, but no, but yeah, I, but, but, but like you it. you you have to have in you know, a lot of these facilities, and, and when you get into commercial and industrial, we'll distribute power at 480 because there's probably equipment that is used at 480. It depends upon what what equipment is in the structure, which that determines the voltage that you're coming into the structure. So if you have like a lab environment that you have, you probably right. have 480 volts, you might be have 480, you might have, a, you probably have larger well, you know, than 480. You know, Tom, I like this discussion because I changed the standards used to say, the, the, the uh, Los Alamos standards used yeah. to say, if you have a service this large, it should be 480. If this yep. should be this, this should be this. I got rid of all that. And I said, look, if you have three-phase motors, yeah. you have to have a three-phase service. Yeah. And so, and, and, and a good example of that, I did, a, I did a, a job in Germany where I had uh, ventilation motors that were class one area. Mm -hmm. And so the ventilation motors had to be three-phase. They were third horsepower. Oh. Third horsepower, three-phase motors. So it doesn't really matter yeah. what the size of the service is. If you need three-phase, you need three-phase. Yeah. The other thing that, that leads into this discussion, or this discussion leads into, is at uh, when I worked for the chemical companies, the 480-volt systems were all high-resistance grounded. Right. And so we did all our MCCs, our motors, yeah. all the 480-volt stuff was all high-resistance grounded. Yeah. And then if all our lighting was at 120, and so from the from the 40 volt system, we would have a solidly grounded 208 120. Yeah, yeah. And so we and and this is becoming more prevalent in our industry is high resistance grounding. Yeah, that's true. Now you're not going to find that in like a residential dwelling no. unit uh, unless I wired it. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but in any case. Um, so 240 volts, single phase or below, you're, if you have a three phase mm -hmm. system installed, you're going to have to get it to single phase, right? You're going to have to get it down to uh, a, a 240 volt uh, or, or whatnot. Right. So you're going to need the right transformers in place. Then we distribute that energy. And what are we supplying? We're supplying receptacles. It could be a construction trailer. You know, it okay. could be parking lot lighting, yep. um, receptacles. Any type of any types of appliance, break rooms well, there you uh, go. in a in a in an industrial facility, commercial facilities like this. I mean, there's there's the 120 volt loads everywhere here. I mean, right. we've got. I'm sitting in a room. We got one, two. We got two printers over here. We got printers behind us. I love these chairs, by the way. Oh yeah, uh, David Sanchez. Good morning, David. We're not too far from you, buddy. Uh, we're in uh, Reno, Nevada. Uh, Joe Ballard. Good to see you online as well. So um, so you've got a lot of a lot of 120 volt loads you got 240 volt loads probably in heavier appliances i mean they've got to have uh uh you got your you got your dryers you got your hvac right your uh, um, uh appliances like your your ovens and your stoves and things of that nature in a dwelling unit so so now let's just talk so we know what types of loads are on we know what types of facilities 120 volts can range anywhere and 240 volts single phase can range anywhere from a from a residential home all the way up through big industrial environments and the hazards what are our primary hazards in those applications at 240 volts what do you think what would you say shock shock and in my opinion well i was i was looking at some statistics Oh, statistics. Oh, CPSC. On, I know, I know, I know. We got know. opinions here. You got statistics? I got, you got opinions, I got statistics. Okay, go for it. Right, so here's what, I, here's what I've learned. Uh, that electrocutions, right? The most common product categories associated with electrocutions over a four-year period were large appliances, which we just said. Okay. There, uh, there were 31 in a four-year period, small appliances, and ladders. So the ladders, oh, you, you're, okay. you're putting a ladder on the straw on the house and you, right. and you, you know, I'm, I get aggressive too. It's just like, I want to throw that extension ladder up as high as I can get it. And then you move it forward and bam. I put my extension ladder in the back of my pickup truck first. Oh, oh, well, that's good. It gets a little bit higher. It gets a little higher. We won't go there. Kids, I do not advise you to do that. Oh, <laughs> forgot. We're meeting. Okay. Go ahead. 
<laughs> Victims' age it appears to be a factor. Now, this was interesting. So this is the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And the Consumer Product Safety Commission gets reports on appliances. Uh, okay. that are sent in, right? So appliances and things that you would see in a dwelling unit would not necessarily be, um, I would say, like uh, an electrical worker at a job site. That's a different database that we get those reports from. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, that would be like OSHA database. Exactly. OSHA okay. reports on the fatalities. And what I like about the CPSC data is it gets you closer to the, to the dwelling unit, closer to the homeowner. So victims, age appears to be a factor in electrocution incidents. During the period covered by this report, which is 2004 to 2013, okay. there were more than three times as many electrocutions to victims 40 through 59 years of age. That's surprising. Me too. And, and it was surprising. So it says uh, 40 to 59 years old uh, than there were to victims 19 years of age and younger, even though the United States population in those two age groups okay. are approximately the same. Wow. So the number of people living from 19 years old and, and, 19 years old and younger, uh, you have the, approximately the n same number of individuals that are bet uh, there uh, as between 40 and 59, and, we, and those individuals who are 40 to 59 are uh, being electrocuted and dying from electricity more often. More wow. of them. Is there, is there any speculation as to what would? Uh, there was. So and, and now so now let's take a look at some of the other data, right? Because okay. because I think it's like a story. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a story, right? So it says uh, now it says the three most common product categories. We know we know their their appliances. Uh, now you know you, you look at um, uh, the ladders. You know you're probably not going to have a young kid uh, putting up ladders, but you have well, the, okay, that's true. You know you have so 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 then you say well appliances. Let's just keep going. The three most common. Okay, we, we know that. Also, in 2010, a larger percentage of the electrocutions occurred during repair work by okay. consumers at residential locations than in prior subsequent years. So for some reason, 2010 rung out, but it's repairs, okay? So, so if you think about, about the individuals, what they're doing, you have, right. you have, uh, you have problems in, in the house, mm -hmm. you've got an appliance that's broken, Yeah. and a, these individuals are not your 19 years and younger that are working on them, Right, it's your older individuals. Well, and I've I've repaired a lot of appliances, and I it's there's probably quite a change nowadays in the way appliances are built, and yeah, you, know, you have a there's a particular maker of washing machines that I mean you have your pump, you have your motor, you have this it's connected with a yep. belt. Yeah, you can replace anything in there at a moment's notice. It's it's made to work on and it's made to repair. Yeah. And I think the appliances today are built differently. I don't know if that's got anything to do with that. I, I don't know. I don't know. Wow. Well, well, you know what? Here, here's the thing. Here's my philosophy. When something breaks, the MacGyver syndrome comes out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix it. Because the, here's the other issue. I think the, the prices of appliances have gone up. Right, so yeah. now you have got a roll of electrical tape. Right <laughs> right he carries his own electrical tape. Now that's a true engineer. No, I don't know if that's an engine. I, 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 I don't know what that I is. I don't know. Okay. I don't know if that was for my mouth or what, but um, that's hilarious. Uh, okay, so how about this? There were an estimate estimated average of forty eight electrocution fatalities associated with consumer products per year over a four year period from two thousand ten through two thousand thirteen, with an estimated. 70 consumer product related electro electrocutions in 2010, 40 in, in 11, 40 in 2012, and 40 in 2013. So we have people working on their appliances. Okay. And, 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 and I, I remember being in a room and someone said that the electrocutions, because people are working on appliances, well, they're not qualified to do that, which is a true statement. They're not qualified. I'm not qualified to work on my microwave and try to fix it. Right. But even though I'm an electrical engineer. That's I mean, why I like the instructions that say, these instructions are for a qualified person to do this. Oh, well, I don't have to follow those instructions because I'm not qualified. I'm not, yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You just opened up a door. So, <laughs> so, so. Oh, oh, see, now I'm sitting up on my seat. So, so when we say, and we say this, hold on, hold on. We got to go to the NEC. We got to, okay. we have to open up the NEC because. Qualified, where's it at? There's, well, a, there's two definitions, there's two parts to the definition of qualified. 
and it, uh, w while you're looking it up. Yeah. One, one of them is that you're trained to recognize as the hazards and, you're, and to mitigate them. Okay, right. that's one. But then the other part of the definition is experience and knowledge with a particular type of equipment. And it goes on to say that you can be qualified for one type of equipment and not qualified for another. So there's three things going on there. You could be a qualified person electrically mm -hmm. to recognize the hazards. You'd be qualified on this particular piece of equipment, yep. but not qualified on this piece of equipment. But in order to work on this piece of equipment to be qualified, you have to be qualified. And you also have to be under the supervision of a qualified person for this piece right. of equipment so that you are uh, you're qualified but you're unqualified on this piece of equipment, becoming qualified. Right, right. So right. it can be a difficult discussion. Sure. Now, most of the, like, I'm, I've just a, did a search on, on NFPA link, and if you don't have NFPA oh, link. Oh, you got to get it. You, you got to get, get it. it. Absolutely. Oh, game changer. It is a game changer. It is so nice. Uh, now, most of the references that I'm looking at in the National Electrical Code, when I search on the word qualified, it says, shall be performed only by qualified persons, uh, right. things like that. Uh, readily accessible to qualified persons. Um, right. mm, and, yeah. and ensure that only qualified persons service the installation. This is uh, restricted industrial establishments. Right. They, and they just changed that in 2023. Yeah. Because because I, I put in a PI. Oh, you're the culprit. Wow. Okay. Well, I put in a PI. It for, just goes to show you anybody, even an engineer, oh, can put a public input in. Go ahead. Even so, yeah. No, because what I said in my in, I had, for my uh, substantiation, I said uh, there are seven different industrial somethings. Right. The NEC used to say in industrial establishments, industrial facilities, industrial wiring systems, industrial occupancies, you know, but then it always said where the conditions of supervision and maintenance ensure that only qualified people can service the installation. Right. And so I guess what the code panels got out of my PI was, look, we got seven different things. Let's just kind of kill that and say, let's make it restricted. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> that was not my intention. That was my, not, uh, my, See, <laughs> be careful what you ask for, right? No, <laughs> my intention was this. Okay, so I work at a laboratory. Yeah. We have extremely restricted conditions there. Right. And o only highly qualified, highly trained people can get in there. You have to have a badge. You have to have all sorts of stuff. Right. And so my take on the uh, industrial location was why don't we just make that in controlled access locations uh, where you know the audience. Right. And so the code panels aren't, weren't ready for that. So maybe, maybe two or three more code cycles, we'll get there. Interesting. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, Tred, Tred Willis says, could it be that the larger appliances have capacitors with a charge left in them, causing the electricians versus someone working on appliance while plugged in? That could be too. That could be. That's a yeah. good point. There's no, um, there's no delineation in the data with regard to the capacitors. That's a good versus, point. Yeah. You know, because that's the whole point, right? Because if you have a capacitor in a piece of equipment yep. and the equipment is listed, well, the listing is going to take care of the hazards of the capacitor right. with the covers on. Right. But right. when you take the covers off, now you're entering a new yep. world. No. Okay, that's a, good, that's a really good point. It's a good point, but, but here's the other issue. When you are, and the reason it would be really difficult to tell, in my opinion, is What's the only, what's the most common form of justified energized work? Uh, screwing in a light bulb. String light. <laughs> <laughs> how about I'm reaching here, Tom? I'm I reaching. Know. How about how about when you are performing, um, when you are maintaining, when you are troubleshooting? Well, okay, okay. right. So, yeah. so if I have a problem with an appliance, right, I got my meter. I've got my meter. You and notice I, the probes on the meter have gotten shorter. They used to be before Joe. Uh, well, who was it? Uh, I went. I went. I went probes on my. No, no, this no. Long. Uh, before Al Gore invented arc flash. Oh, okay, okay. So, no, the probes on the meter were like an inch. The the metal exposed metal. Yeah. What was happening when people started using uh, arc flash suits? Mm -hmm. They started getting real clumsy. 
And there were because some, of the gloves. There were, because of, of the gloves, lack okay. of dexterity. And there were some actually face to face flashovers because oh, really? of the meter lead going from say between face to face. Oh, that's interesting. And so the meter manufacturers are saying, oh, okay, you know what? With all these these hoods on and the gloves and sure. all of this stuff, that makes sense. we're going to make the meter leads a lot smaller. I'm buying what you're selling. I'm buying it. Okay, all right. Go. So so you have troubleshooting, and when you're troubleshooting an appliance. Of, of any type of nature, you have to have it energized. I mean, especially if oh, yeah. it's digital, yeah. electronics, right. if you're trying to watch something go through a cycle, like especially like on HVAC, you know, you're, you're and I watch my HVAC guy a lot uh, when he's trouble, when, when he's working on my system. I mean, I'm, you never want to, I pity, my dad used to work on HVAC stuff, right? Okay. And he used to say he hated engineers' homes. Oh, okay. Because there was I the can, engineer always asking, what are you doing? I, I Why are you that. doing that? You know, okay. and, and, and he had to like, he called at babysitting them, you know. Right. So. I, some actually, I've seen where some service companies say uh, in their, their hourly charges. Right. Yeah. They they would have like fifty dollars an hour, <laughs> and then said sixty dollars an hour if you're watching me, <laughs> seventy dollars an hour if you're an engineer. Absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> seventy dollars. Yeah. yeah. And that was my dad. He hated. I, he raised two engineers. Right. So, but um, but uh, when I watch uh, Bill, my, uh, my and he is the best. He he was a he's a uh, uh, he fought in Afghanistan and all this other good stuff and he's just he is the best troubleshooter I've ever seen. Yeah, you always hear that. Oh my god. You always hear that. What you never hear, and this comes from a Seinfeld episode. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, you ought to go to my doctor. He's the worst. He's a he's a real butcher. Oh, <laughs> he's a real butcher. Yeah, Everyone's well, the best. Yeah, here yeah. yeah. Bill Bill is absolutely he's the best. Okay. He is absolutely the best. And I and the and I specifically request him. I I say, but I'll pay more for this guy because when he comes down and he does the simplest things, but then he takes the time. I mean, he'll come to a service call. And he walks through, tells me what he's doing. Oh, wow. That's and, great. And, and it, sometimes it's annoying, but he teaches. That's cool. I told him that he ought to teach classes. But in any case, um, I watch how these these people work on that equipment. And okay. it has to be energized because he's watching it go through a cycle. He's yeah. testing voltages on different areas. And, he, and he'll tell me, he'll say, well, when this coil kicks in, I should see this many volts here. Uh, and, and he's measuring. So okay. he is constantly exposed. And that's all justified energized work. Right. And and, right. and and it's shock hazard is what you're looking at. Right. Because because in a lot of these applications and I'll I'll um, hey, Willie Snyder, there it is. Um, so we are close to you, Willie. I'm, I think I'm in the same time zone. I think Willie's in Denver. I have no clue what time zone I'm in anymore because I, I the day that I moved here was it was the daylight. Set. Well, I moved. No, we, we went through time. We, yeah, were we, went, a, we were in a time machine because oh, yeah. they changed the clocks they while did. we were in the air. They did. I felt the plane like go forward a little bit. Yeah, a wrinkle in time. <laughs> it was a wrinkle in time. So, 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 uh, the statistics. Oh, how much time we got? All right, we are. Um, all right, we we got plenty of time. I think the other thing before I also uh, do you think that some of this was the driver for GFCI GFCI's going up to two hundred and forty volts? Well, so yeah, well, I, I, I'm, okay, you you brought up a you brought up a very touchy point, but that is uh, that is uh, that is a touchy point. I, uh, it is. I mean, it's it's. But it's, we're talking about two hundred and forty volts. No, you're sense. you're right. You're right. You're right. And and we did expand in a residential dwelling unit. We expanded panel two, and I do not speak on behalf of panel two nor NFPA. Nor IAI. Right. What comes out of here? What comes? What comes out of here was created here, and it all comes from the heart. But um, what we did in panel two was we went higher based upon data like this. And that's what I'm seeing. I mean, when, when you're telling me stuff like this, that's the first thing that jumps into my mind. Yeah. And and you know, and this this is a good uh, topic right here because some people say, and you and I know one of these people. Uh, some people say, I don't see any reason for GFCI, for an appliance to be on a GFCI, if the appliance is, you know, just wired in, that's the only thing on that oh, circuit. hardwired and it's direct or, uh, yeah. Um, or if it's yeah, receptacle yeah, yeah, yeah. like a yeah. clothes dryer, yep. you know, so I don't see any reason. Well, but you're bringing up some really good reasons. Yeah, these are the statistics. Yeah, this is. You can't, you can't argue with yeah, this. No, it's like we can, we can have the debate on, is it the capacitor? Was it unplugged when that person was in it? We don't know those details. Right. But we, we know people are dying on this equipment. And a lot of the examples that we see in the CPSC. So there is a, another tool that CPSC has, which is the NEISS National National Estimate of Injuries. 
National Estimate of Injuries. Uh, I, I don't know what the heck NEISS stands for, but in any case, I ran a query. I, you know, and, and I think this, this is my query results. I was going to do this live. I was going to go to the NEISS database okay. and then and do a query because we uh, one of our code making panel members did a query which justified expanding GFCI protection for for cooktops, microwaves, and other examples, and it was based upon the data from this query. But it took I started no, but, okay, it. Okay, so data would be passed, but. You you started saying national, yeah. So so this is national estimate of injuries treated estimate. That almost sounds like it's predictive. Yeah, that's that's true. Suggested so citation: Consumer Product Safety Commission, National Electrical Engineer, and it is National Electrical Injury Surveillance System. Okay. So the NEISS is an injury surveillance system. When okay. when you get injured, okay, and you report it. And I'm not sure how it gets reported because not all injuries are in here, right? I know I got injured and my, my name is not in here, but, okay. but somehow, I don't know if they, if they get it through the hospital, that's another great experiment we can do. I, maybe yeah. I'll try to get somebody from the CPSC. Maybe, that, yeah, that, but that's a good topic for a future discussion. That's exactly right. So, so um, I searched for just electrocutions in uh, uh, from 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 the database, and, okay. and and it could be a death, it could be not a death, it could just be an injury. Okay, I didn't I didn't specify. Only oh yeah, because people. this is an injury. Yes, it's an injury. So okay, I could I could uh, I could I could experience maybe a, a shock, but not die, right? Okay, and and maybe I was admitted to a hospital. Maybe I wasn't. Maybe I had burns as a result, okay. or maybe I fell off the ladder because of a shock. I wonder if this is the same database where they did all that stuff. Remember when they did tamper resistance receptacles? And they had all the data of the kids, the number uh, yeah. of shocks, uh, like 10,000 or something per year. Yeah. Some of that, I think, came from the NEIS, but they also did uh, a separate research. And there's a whole separate research report available yeah. from NFPA Research Foundation. The, I, I, yeah, when those things first came out, I just thought it was manufacturers or whatever. And then I started looking at the data. They're like, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah this well, that's, that's always the first impression, right? So <laughs> it's like someone's trying to sell something. And, yeah. But, but when you start looking at the data, but um, in any case, uh, I'm not going to download this file, but my, when I just looked at electrocutions over a 10-year period, I had 94,000 in 2012. Look at the numbers. Look how they go. They go 94,000 in, in 2012 to, two, to 117,000 in no, 2021. Wait a those are injuries, not electrocutions, right? Some of them are electrocutions, but okay, I did but those, not delineate between. Those aren't only electrocutions. Those are. It could be anything. It could yeah. be anything. Right? I'd have to. Yeah, there's right. there's a lot of, and I'd have to. I'd have to wow, really download. That's a lot. But there's a lot of people. I mean, just just the number of records and incidents that yeah. they've collected is tremendous. And then then you would have to, like you said, you have to sort down through this to say right. how many of these were truly an electrical. Right. Because I've read some of these where. You, you would go, I don't even know why they qualified it as an electrical engine. I, I did this years ago with, for actually for a report here in IEEE, um, electrocutions from different and reasons. And so I sifted through the OSHA, at that time, 34 year yeah. database. And there's a lot of information in there. And some of it's, some of it's detailed, some of it's very sketchy. Yeah. Yeah. So you know what? I think I can. Let me do this. See, I don't have my... I don't have my Willie Snyder. I think it got weird when EVSE started coming with integral personal protection and manufacturer says GFCI protection is not required when hardwired. Well, that's, you know, that, that's a great example of the evolution of uh, products and National Electric Code and how it all fits together. You know, it's kind of a... Yeah. Leapfrog, cat and mouse, whatever you want to call it. Evolution, I think, is a good good term. Yeah, so and then what he's referring to is that, you know, when um, uh, the 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 uh, car charging environment well, they, yeah, they the created the supply so, equipment. Well yeah. yeah, so the supply equipment. So they have the, right. the car charger which basically does the the protection between right. the charger and the car. Right? But yeah. but it doesn't do the protection uh, from upstream. So that's the other thing to remember from a shock perspective. The, the, 
when you have, if you have GFCI protection, it looks downstream, it doesn't look behind. Right. It. So I can say I have GFCI protection uh, between the vehicle and this assembly, but then I'm going to wire that assembly into the infrastructure, and what about if that assembly fails or the assembly right. becomes... Right, it depends on where the sensor is, but generally speaking, yeah. 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 Because the thing about a conductor is conductor is equipotential along the whole conductor. Yeah. And so upstream, downstream, if it's bolted together, it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. But you got electronics. A good example is a VFD. You know, a VFD, totally variable frequency drive, it takes the input power, totally yeah. converts it into something else. Oh, yeah. And the output is absolutely, totally separate from the input. Absolutely right. And, and it's different frequencies. Different and, everything. And, so, yeah. And, and, so, I, yeah, and I had a question from somebody who asked if I could put a thermal mag breaker on the secondary of a drive and whether or not it would work. Yes and no. Magnetic, yes. Thermal, no. Yeah, so... No, yeah. reverse that. Because because there's not enough current and the output of a, a VFD, depending, depending on the relative rating of the VFD to the brake. And, and, the, and the, the devices are rated for 50, 60 hertz. I know, for example, if you put, uh, if you're going to put your breaker on a 400 hertz system, which you would find like in an airplane or something sure. like that, or a helicopters no. and all that, they, they'll use different frequencies. You have to derate and right. adjust the rating of the breaker because the breaker is going to respond differently. Well, yeah, and, and that brings up a good point. For example, on the output of a UPS system, yeah, you know, it's an inverter. The out is an inverter. So how much current can it actually produce? Can it can't produce what we normally consider fault current? And so, is it, if I have a 200 amp UPS and, and it feeds a 200 amp panel with a main breaker, mm -hmm. is that main breaker ever going to trip on instantaneous? I don't think so. Right, right, right. You know. Yeah. So there's some pretty strange stuff that happens. So Willie says you can't use a Tesla then because it's not compatible with a Class A device. So here's the thing. Here's what I've learned, Willie. On these EV charger things, okay. there is a there's a um, the the one of the one of the areas that was of concern was in the connection with the vehicle. Okay. They use a they use the equipment grounding conductor. They use that conductor for communications. So okay. they're putting current over that, which might be incompatible with a GFCI because it's current that's going outside of the normal path. And they're using it for communications, all this other good stuff. Right. It would look like, if it looks like an imbalance. Right. Okay. But, but that's not being seen by the infrastructure right. over current device because that is between the the vehicle so i talked to you all about this as well that's between the the controller and the vehicle right. that's that and, and they'll offer their own shock protection whether it's double insulated okay. whether they do all these different technologies to ensure gfci protection of that portion of the circuit that's the way i understand it it could be 100 percent wrong uh, I got to do a, you know, you know how well, it goes, right? Speaking of one hundred percent wrong, now that you bring me, me up, okay, <laughs> you know, no, I, I just want for the listening audience, it's yeah. something they already know, yeah, that there isn't a car charger. It's not a car charger. It's a supply device. It's, That's it's true. supply equipment because the charger, in all cases, has to be in the vehicle. That's exactly right. The charger has to be engineered for the batteries. Not only is there a charger in the vehicle, there is a battery management system yeah. in the That's right. oh, vehicle. In the vehicle itself. And yeah, char absolutely. So the charger has to be in the vehicle because yep. it has to be engineered for the particular batteries absolutely. that are in that vehicle. So the thing that's outside the vehicle, like Willie said, it's supplying power. It's just supply equipment. That's yeah, it's exactly right. What is it? I don't yeah. know. Now, it's there may equipment. be communications going on between right. the charger and the supply. There's equipment. all sorts of things going on. Exactly right. And and so those those are systems that are listed together. And they they are, so, they, I would call them almost self-contained. So I posed the issue to UL about the compatibility concerns. And they were like, look, we're installing, these things are getting installed all over the place. And they're on GFCI protected But that's circuits. actually why the charger has to be in the vehicle. Because there's no way that the supply equipment and the vehicle can be listed together. Yeah, yeah, Not yeah. if you have different vehicles. Tesla may be different because they have a proprietary system. Yeah. But um, you have different vehicles using the same charger. Yeah. They're not listed together. Right. But the, so that's another reason why the charger has to be in the vehicle. Yeah. So, but but the the compatibility concern, uh, 
we're not seeing those tripping issues, even though they're putting them on the circuits. Okay. So that's, and, and, and in any case. This, this is going to so, work its way out. You know, yeah, it's yeah, gonna, it, yeah. It, it takes two or three code cycles to, you know, iron things out. This is going to be one of those. All right. So now let's take, let's shift gears. All right. We know we got the shock hazard. We know the receptacle is 120 volts. So uh, NFPA 70E sets the threshold for shock at 50 volts, right? Yes, it does. So <clears throat> it considers hazardous voltage. Yep. Um, and there's lots and lots of studies on that. Lots of studies. So now, and now, and we know, like in a dwelling unit, we know we go above 50 volts. So we know we have shock. And okay. we know the protection, how do we protect from shock? We, uh, we turn it off and you know we what establish touch. an electrically <clears throat> safe work condition. Right, you know what to touch. And, and I find myself remiss in that in, because, uh, for example, my, my oldest daughter lives in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And in Switzerland, they have a really interesting, weird rule that when you move houses, you take your light fixtures with you. I, it's, it's just strange. You take your light fixtures? You take your light fixtures with you. So you move into a house and you have wires hanging out the ceiling. And the homeowners, and this is 230 volts. And so the homeowners are wiring up light fixtures. So whenever I go to Switzerland, I'm getting ready to go there next month again, and I'm probably gonna be working on light fixtures. And so I'm working with these wires and everything, and, and people ask me, well, how do you know what to touch? You know, what, aren't you, well, okay, the circuit's off, all this other thing. You have to lick your fingers first, right? Well, yeah, there you go. You okay. gotta lick your fingers all right. first. All right, mm -hmm. Wow, so they take their, I mean, I know, I thought we were weird. We took our appliances with us. We wanted our dryer right, and like our refrigerator. And our refrigerator. It's so strange. And in, in, a, in, a, in a European, now, Switzerland is not part of the EU. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, but still, it's highly regulated in all sorts of things. Interesting. Why would they allow homeowners to take their own light fixtures and replace them? Yeah. At 230 volts. It's just well, one of those strange things. I mean, things. anybody can do that. There's no prohibition sure. in the States. We just don't do that. Right. It's, I mean, just it's, a, it's, it's a selling feature of the house. I mean, you, you walk in, you see a nice chandelier. You're like, wow, you're yeah. expecting to see that chandelier when you That's, move in. And I look like this. And you walk in Switzerland, there's yeah. two wires hanging out the ceiling. <laughs> oh, yes. Wow. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Off track. Go ahead. Yeah, but so 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 you have the shock hazard, and you know you've got um, you anywhere from the panel board load center, anywhere down in the power distribution system, our methods to uh, to uh, reduce shock in those applications is I establish a electrically safe work condition right. and, and I still have to do lockout tag out in a residential dwelling unit. Think about it. And probably even more so in a residential dwelling. You, if, you're, if your panel board's downstairs and you're oh, working well, on a sure, circuit, for sure, yeah. you're gonna turn the breaker off for that circuit. You should lock and tag that out. 70E still applies in a residential dwelling unit. I had somebody tell me 70E doesn't apply in residential. It's, it's only commercial and industrial. I'm like, well, no, it's, it's any place where you are working. If you're a residential wireman and you're working in a residential home, 70E applies to you. If you're an electrical inspector and you're inspecting a home, that is where you work. So 70E still applies. Well, but if 70E in the beginning says this is for qualified people, well, then yeah, I don't then, have to yeah, use then, it. then you don't have to use it. Yeah, that's right. Okay, it's only for qualified people. So if you're unqualified, yeah, you, know, you, just, you just lick your fingers. They call that the gene pool, right? So in okay. any case. So, um, but but that is, that's an important thing to remember that you still have to follow all of the, uh, now, again, here's another big, I think a big mistake a lot of people make. They say, well, uh, you know, 70E still applies. Yes, it does. And they'll say, wow, I don't have to worry about arc flash. I don't have to worry about this. And we're going to talk about arc flash here in a second. But you still have to build your own safety plan. If you're a residential wireman, you're going to take, I, I look at 70E like and 70B like a uh, the ingredients to your souffle, right? You're going to make, you're going to make an omelet. Right. Wow. And you make omelets for a limit. That's what you make. All of a sudden, I've omelets. been ushered into a whole new level. Oh, you're in a whole different world. Okay. So, do you need do you need um, uh, all of the other things that might be in a kitchen that aren't related to an omelet? No. I mean, if that's what you do is make omelets, then you put your recipe together based upon building your recipe for okay. an omelet. Right. Okay. And then you deliver your you make your souffle and 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 you 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 create your your uh, uh, recipe based upon the ingredients. Same thing with 70E. If you're a residential wireman, 
You oh, don't have to I, okay. worry about 138 KV, all these other things. Right. You would take out a 70E what applies to you. Right, it's like a buffet line. Job. Exactly, it's like a buffet. 70, 70E is all the food behind the buffet line. Exactly. Right. And then you and, and you say, And then you take, say, okay, I need this, this. And I'm this. on keto, so I'm, I'm not going to take any of these carbs, those carbs. <laughs> and, and, you know, and we all know that there's no carbs in cheesecake. Oh, or or, or or apple strudel. There's no carbohydrates in apple strudel either. Or you, cheese you, danishes. If you don't agree with me, you, there's the door. No, I, yeah. <laughs> no I'm thinking of Sergeant Schultz. Okay, go ahead. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Ooh, apple strudel. Yes, uh, apple strudel. All right, so now we know shock. We know we got shock hazards uh, in, in all these in appliances, right. connected lows, all the way up through. Let's talk arc flash. Oh, do we have to? Yes, we do. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do cover, it. So, cover me. I'm going in. Cover me. I'm going. So there was <laughs> there was an interesting paper. Um, there is an interesting paper that is going to be delivered, I think, today. <clears throat> on and the title of the paper is Drumble, please. Brrr. Sustainability oh. of an electric arc flash at a voltage of 240 volt AC. And 150 volt DC. And does it say anything about the number of phases? Well, let's see. Because um, while you're looking. Single phase voltage of 240 volt AC. Okay, that means nothing to me. Oh, well, okay. Okay, and the reason it means, well, no, actually it does. Yeah. I, I jumped ahead a little bit too far. Okay. Okay, because when you say 240. Right you are coming off of a 240 volt single winding transformer. Right. Now, let's say it's 120, 240. Right. That's still a single winding. The 120 is just a sure. center tap. Yeah. Okay, so it's a 240 volt winding. Yes. Now, if you were to say a 240 volt single phase panel, now we're ambiguous because uh, that yeah. 240 volt single phase panel can either be fed from a single winding that's exactly right or it can yes. be fed from two windings right. of 208 one yeah, yeah now yeah you're absolutely right so okay so yeah, so let's, right. let's so we're, we're going to narrow the context is, is 240 volt ac single phase single, voltage single winding yes right okay right and then the one fifth well i'm not going to talk dc i'm not going to talk about oh let's not do it We'd yeah, have to yeah. bring Lloyd in yeah, here. Yeah, we have to bring Lloyd in here, and, and, then, and then then you and I. Can we would need up. at least four more hours. Yes. All right. So so but it would be interesting. Yeah. So there are three individuals, uh, from uh, two from Hydro Quebec. Okay. Out of Montreal, there's a Kirk Gray, an S. Robert, and a Remy Haye. Uh, from Mont Saint Hilaire. He's the one who makes the omelets. QC omelet. Canada. I'm telling you. Oh, the must. souffles. The souffles. He's the yeah. one who makes souffles. Okay. Yeah, yes, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, so this is this is out of Canada, and and I know that the IEEE IEEE. I'm on the steering committee, and we've had some extra funding, and we are uh, investigating the floor for single phase applications. So, were you Do steering the boat when it ran off the cliff? <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead. No, but that that's, okay. So, so you, but you're but you're looking at single phase applications, and I'm really glad you're saying that because this has one, been one of my questions all along. I read 1584; it's yep. purely three phase. Everything about it is written three phase, uh, and a lot of companies have have been struggling yep. because they say, "Well, what do we do with our single phase systems?" And they don't know what to do, so they say, "Well, we'll just use the three phase number because we don't know what else to do." Yeah, exactly. So, so this is very timely. This so, is exciting. Yeah, so so we have research going on for IEEE as part of the the same group that created 1584. We're doing single phase testing. Um, and that's, that's uh, I, I think we're pretty much done with the lab testing. Dr. Lee is pulling his day together. And, and this then you time you're, this not, you're actually keeping the tests. You're not throwing them away. Right. So that okay, was the that's issue. Okay, that's good. That was the issue before was when you didn't have, when they didn't have an arc that sustained, they ignored it. Right. And then, because their goal was and not to, decide, to determine that lying in the sand. Their goal was to determine an equation for calculating right. arc flash. Yeah. And, and the unfortunate thing is we lost all the data. Yeah. Saying, oh, by the way, we couldn't get it to sustain, sustain itself under all these, these conditions. Right. right. Okay. Okay. So now they're so so you have IEEE uh, focusing on testing. Doctor Lee is doing that testing at the Busman facility down in St. Louis, and and then you have this paper with this study. Now, what they did for the for the two forty volt single phase testing. This these are their parameters. Uh, 
a maximum voltage short circuit current capacity of 10 and 15,000 amps. And they're saying that's typically, that's normal on these 240 volt applications. And I would argue that's probably a ballpark. And I would say it's probably even less in many applications in dwelling units. When you look at a dwelling unit, you're looking at, in some cases, the tr in a lot of cases, the transformer is way out, uh, way out on right, a pole right. somewhere, and then you have all that conductor down to the down to the house. I know in in, in a few homes we measured uh, 500 amps or less than 500 amps. Wow, or, and you're and, talking and about below a thousand amps on, at the dwelling unit. And you're talking about what we would call available fault current. Available fault current. Correct. 500 amps. Yes. Yeah, because I've I've done uh, uh, one of the cases I was in there was um, a transformer was right up above the house. I mean, it was probably it was 20, right there. 20 feet away. And when I did infinite bus on the transformer, which is what the, you know, the prosecuting whatever side, yeah, they had expert witness. Anyway, uh, he just did infinite bus on the transformer. Uh -huh. And so what I did is I took the old busman equations and I, um, did I started doing the the drop wire and then started doing the service entrance cables and I got it below ten thousand pretty easy. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You know? <clears throat> now, so so they did this testing at ten thousand uh, and fifteen thousand at two forty volts. Okay. Uh, the space between the electrodes was five and six millimeters, which I don't even know what five and six millimeters is. It's about, about, about yeah, what, that big quarter inch. About a quarter inch. All right, I'm not a millimeter guy. Calorimeters, uh, re the calorimeter reading distance was established at 18 and 15 inches for the working distance. Okay, distance. so we're talking about, first of all, 10,000 amps. 10 and 15,000. 15,000 amps. Yep, 240 volts, single phase. Okay. Yep, and, 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 um, and uh, the, the, the electrodes, remember, um, they, they did arcs in a box, right? So right. They, this, the, the gap between electrodes is four to six they say four to six millimeters, yeah, five, five and six, six millimeters. millimeters. Okay. And then the working distance where you put the calorimeter. So remember, okay, a right. calorimeter just measures heat. Right. Right. Well, not pressure. Calories. It's the calories. Right. So that's why they call it a calorimeter. Calorimeter. <laughs> so it's not just a clever name. <laughs> it's not just a clever name. Wow. Okay. No, not like, yeah, not like Thomas, right? So, <laughs> uh, so they did 18 and 15 inches, so 457 and 381 millimeters. Okay. And the ty uh, type of arc initiation electrode material was copper rod okay. with flat ends. Okay. And 25 millimeters in diameter. That's so the initiator. An inch in diameter? Yeah. They did. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It's a big one. Uh, arc, uh, arc start uh, wire material was a 20 gauge copper conductor. Okay. The, the trigger that's wire. What, that's what the you trigger. Know, and, and my brain was wandering there for a minute because I'm thinking about copper bus and copper bus. The typical figure is a thousand amps per square inch. Okay. But, okay. So if you have like a yeah. half by four inch bus, anyway, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I use that all the time actually. All right. So, um, okay. So you have one inch diameter and you have what gauge trigger wire? Uh, uh, 20, 20. Yeah, gauge. 20 gauge trigger yep. wire, okay. Yeah, and the maximum arc current injection time would be two seconds. So, and then what they're looking for was they wanted to try to see, um, they were looking for that number, that magic number of 1.2 calories. Do they exceed it or not? Okay. Now, what they didn't do, if they did exceed it, which they did, um, they didn't calculate what was the arc flash boundary. So, uh, okay, that's a good question, I think, for when he delivers this paper. Um, because this, now the test results, test results. All right, table two is the 240 volts. Oh, we're jumping right to table two. What is table one? Table one's DC. Oh, okay. Yeah. Table two, let's go to table yeah, two. Yeah, let's go to table two. <laughs> and we didn't want to go get Lloyd, so. Oh, no, let's All go right. to table two. All right, we're going to do table two. Here we go. Ready? Working distance. Oh, man, look at these calories. So, bolted fault current value of 10,700. Okay. Uh, the elect the orientation was in line and then parallel in line and parallel in line and parallel is that HCB because it's pointing at you I think so yes okay the parallel yeah and parallel would be uh, in, this way so all right so box width <laughs> it's I like oh no width box I I read box width and it says with box. <laughs> Give me a break. I'm just not going there. Just that's keep just, going. Yeah, man, I'm telling you, that's the enclosure. That, that, so what they did, they did tests with okay, the enclosure. So with the enclosure, and, without the enclosure. And without the enclosure, open air, right? Right. The test voltage was 235 volts. That's what they were reading. Okay. Um, the electrode gap, six millimeters, we said. Um, and then your arcing current 
For and the this tenth, was actually empirically measured. Yes. Okay. Yep. Good. The 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 bolt default was ten thousand seven hundred. The arcing currents were around eighty five hundred amps. So around eighty percent. That surprised me because me the too. the table in the front of fifteen eighty four shows that for two hundred and eight volt systems. The arcing current is about 20% of the yeah, fault current. Not, not That's case. what the tape, but in this case, you're saying it's 85%. 85%, yeah. Wow. Exactly. And the arc voltage was around 91 volts, which we and, the, and then, okay, so calories, incident energy, calories per centimeter squared at 457 millimeters. That's 18 inches. Okay. Okay. Three calories, 2.7 calories, and 4.95 calories because they ran at three different tests with the same parameters. So they got anywhere from 2.7 on the low end to 4.95, almost 5 calories on the high end. Wow. That's at 240 volts, though. It's not 120 volts. But it's also at 10,000 amps. 10,700 to be exact. <laughs> but yeah. Yep. Now, okay, so they did more. Oh, but there's more. Oh, there's more. Pray tell. Yep. They did another bolted fault, 10,700. They did three more tests. Uh, everything was the same except... The electrode gap was five millimeters. And so this is a difference of one millimeter okay. in the electrode gap. And the energy ranged from 1.3 calories to 5.95 calories. And the working distance is lower, shorter, 381. Okay, so the so working distance is shorter. The working distance okay. is shorter. I would expect the energy to go higher because if the working distance in the previous was 457 millimeters right. mm -hmm. and it was three calories, if it was 381 centimeters, yeah, yeah, it would be higher, right? So this is at 381 millimeters and you went from 1.3, two shots at 1.3 calories and one at 5.95. That's interesting. That's really surprising. That is. I, I, I'm, I don't want to say blown away. <laughs> well, you stand close enough. If I stand close enough, I yeah. would be blown away by those yeah, but, results. Well, you know, but here's the thing, though. 1.2. Now, this, remember, put, put things into perspective. 1.2 calories is what we look for in the arc flash boundary. Right. So it's second degree. So burn. we're talking 18 inches. Right. right? And. It's, well, no, 18 inches or 457, so it's smaller than 18 inches. What's uh, 381? i got to go back up to the beginning. 381 was 15 inches. So at 15 inches, you're at 1.3. 15, that, that means you're, you're not in a full arc flash suit right, sure. unless you get your head in there, right? But you are, you, you, your, your, your hands, your arms... Um, and, and I would right. say you would have to have your probably a face shield or whatnot. So I would liken this to service entrance equipment. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would liken it to service now, entrance equipment. What about, okay, so I've heard a, oh gosh, do I want, what do I want to call it? Um, one of the electrical myths, I'm not sure what to call it. But I've heard of a thing saying that once you're below three protective devices, you don't have to worry about arc flash. Mm. I know that's not. Yeah, I don't buy that. I don't buy it either. But since so here's you're, the issue. Since so, you're a guy that right, well, does what you let's do. Let's say that that last device is on the secondary of a transformer. Okay. Well, okay, that's all right. So now you now now well, you're going to qualify it. Okay. Now, so okay. what, what now you're saying, three no, what so, you're saying is the first two devices are say at 480, and the third one, third one is on the other side of the transformer. Right. I and now that third one, the incident energy is going to be very high. Well, no, of course because, it will be because yeah. you're on the secondary side of the transformer. Okay. Exactly. So I just wanted to. So there's there's those. Have you ever heard that though before about no, the three I've devices? Heard that. Okay, I don't buy no. it. It's, yeah, but I'm just letting you know I, that yeah. that I've heard it out there working with. Uh, yeah, with I think Mark. there's a lot, a lot that, that that depends on the conditions. Any comments on the chat? Uh, oh, I don't know. Let's look. Let's see if we're chatting. Whoop! I'm sure we are. What do we got here? Uh, oh, uh, okay. So Tom, Eric, greetings. Double treat that you guys are the best are enclosed panel boards, right? <laughs> Robert from Omaha. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, my friend. Yes, the impedance of the transformer is lower these days. It is. It is. It's not. Yes, uh, the the whole DOE energy savings. I forget what year that was. Two thousand four or whatever. The you probably know because you're a manufacturer. When, when was the energy? Oh, the energy. I can't remember. It, uh, it's early two thousands. Whatever yeah, it was. I, I think it was late nineties. Actually, 
something something like for some reason 99 is in my head and i don't know yeah why. that that may have been when they introduced pay, the whatever and then they didn't publish it till 2004 Could or be. something Could one be. of the chats you know they may yep. set us straight on that one but impedance less on transformers you know and and just to really get off the topic imagine one of these days that they ever have superconductors oh yeah what's that going to do to fault current calculations yeah, I, in my opinion, so here's what I think. My, in my opinion, so residential. So, so what we know. So, so here's let's, let's just get, yeah, get let's back just, to the program. Let's, yeah, but I want I want to build on that too. So, but but in the 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 based on the study test, test data, and they did fifteen thousand amps, fifteen thousand amps, and the energy was up to thirteen and twelve point six calories. So I would argue, I would say that if you're at service entrance equipment. And your available fault currents above ten thousand amps. Yeah, you could have a significant event at two forty volts. You could, but there's not going to be a residence that's at ten thousand amps. Well, but if uh, here's the thing, if you if you had a residence or a multifamily dwelling in it, maybe I don't know. But I would agree with you because now here's the thing: if you're at fifteen thousand amps, you don't have ten k breakers. So the indicator for this right would be that now. Oh, okay, wait, hold on. So man. Even if I had 22K breakers, I'm calculating yeah. a number that is very large based upon an infinite bus, probably from the utility. And yeah. in and reality, you're in not reality, that's have, not happening. It, you're not going to have that. You know, the infinite bus is nice because, you know, what I do when, when I look at equipment yeah. uh, is I'll, I'll do an infinite bus first. And, and that infinite bus is simply secondary current divided by the percent impedance. Um, and... If the equipment is within, if, if that's within the equipment, look, hey, I stopped there. Yeah. Now, if if the uh, infinite bus fault current is greater than my equipment, well, then I start adding in the wiring. Yeah. And that fault current starts dropping off pretty quickly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, here's some of their summaries, just just because we're coming to the end here. Okay. At 235 volt AC, it was not possible to initiate an arc with a parallel, parallel electrode configuration even if they were only spaced five millimeters apart. And the arc was blow, blown out basically very fast. So it initiates and goes away. Okay. The value of single phase is at zero crossing, and you don't have multiple phases. That That's been my that contention arc. all along. And yep. I've talked to 1584 people about that, and they say that I don't have any idea what I'm talking about. Um, which may very well be true, yeah, yeah. but it, to me, it just seems when I've got two phases and they have different zero crossings, yeah. well, then one's feeding the fault when the other uh, one's at zero, exactly right. but yeah. if I have a single winding, then I have a zero crossing, an overall zero crossing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and it's just how fast you get through that zero crossing. And, it, but, whether but, it can sustain, sustain and restrike and exactly. whatever else, ionizing the air and yep. all that good stuff. And then they said 235 volts AC with an available bolted fault, 10,000 was possible with the inline configuration to initiate an electric arc and sustain it during 0.24 to 1.2 seconds. The incident energy was able to reach six calories per centimeter squared at 18 inches. How so. do you think this affects the current 1584 statement that arcs are probably not sustainable below 2,000, 2000. Uh, fault current amps? Um, 2000, 2000 available fault current amps. Uh, you know, well, no, they got rid of the 125. That's right, they cable. did, and that's three phase though. In in it 50, is three phase. In 1584, the three phase. They're saying that was it 2000. I thought it was 4000. Maybe well, it was 2000. 1584 says 2000. Okay. I think FCOG has. I'm not sure who in FCOG, but some group has recommended 4,000. Right. So at Los Alamos National Laboratory, we're using 4,000 right now. I would love to use five or 6,000. Mm -hmm. And what, I'm, I'm just wondering how all this plays in. Yeah, and now this, again, this is 240 volt single phase and they can sustain it. They can sustain it when they have a, an available voltage fault current of 10,000 amps in, in um, inline configuration. Okay. So, so, so I guess the bottom line is, so here's my, here's my takeaway. Okay. From an arc flash perspective, if I'm working on the service, I definitely have arc flash concerns. If the lower my fault current gets, the lower my fault current gets based upon the, the data that I'm looking at, the lower the fault current gets, the less likely you have for sustaining an arc flash and your work 
uh, PPE is really gloves, glasses. Yeah. Right. Gloves, glasses. You don't want to be wearing flammable clothes or clothes right. that will melt just in case anything comes out at you. Right. And I think your PPE for arc flash is minimal. Right. But you're but you always have to worry about shock. Always wear cotton. Um, my thing is I'm not so sure. I I I see the paper, okay, and you're telling me they did it at ten thousand and fifteen thousand. Yeah. I would love for him to done it at five thousand. Yeah. That would be because that's such a great value. I agree. Five thousand is is where the breakers, um, if they're none, yeah. I don't even, even know if there are any five thousand amp breakers these days. No, no, everything's been everything's ten thousand. Yeah, but National Electric Code, if it's not marked, it's five thousand. That's been a mainstay of the industry yeah. for such a long time. No, you're absolutely. That right. it seems to me that the uh, utilities have and maybe they did this by accident maybe they did this on purpose i don't know right but the vast majority of all homes are going to have less than five thousand yeah oh no i i agree with you there and that's that's research there's research on that all right so all right so we are we are at time okay and um and we got to get ready for the uh workshop is going to start now no okay. go ahead you're fine go ahead in yeah good we're we're, we're good and um, and I think that uh, I think that's it. So I want to appreciate everybody out there who tuned in. And I thank oh, you. I mean, I can't believe you decided to. I mean, he's like, hey, let's talk about low voltage. I'm like, hey, he's, I'll talk about anything you want to talk about. Anything, yeah, yeah, let's talk about anything. Let's just let's just do it. Yeah. So um, so I, I I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Eric. Right. Appreciate Stromberg it, for your uh, for your knowledge and your expertise and your commitment to safety. I really appreciate well, it. You're welcome. And thank you for making this available. Excellent. Excellent. All right, everybody out there, I gotta find my I A E I end. So everybody out there, thanks for joining. <laughs> thanks for uh, for contributing to the electrical safety and the electrical industry. Thanks for all you do. Remember to stay safe, and please stay healthy. We'll see you next week, next Tuesday. Same bad time and same bad channel. Talk to you okay. later. Okay. See you. I love it. All right. Here we go.